You are very interested in doing AI research, but you don't feel like you have the necessary prerequisite to do so. You are thinking of maybe doing a PhD or a master degree, but you are unsure if it's the right way to go about it. If that sounds like you, then great, this video will help you out. I'll show you the prerequisite that you need to have in order to start doing research in AI or other fields. The advice is pretty universal here. We'll also hear directly from Joseph Suarez, a PhD researcher from MIT that is a true reinforcement learning powerhouse. It will give us some insight about how he got started, why is he still going, and how he is structuring his day for intense focus work. Joseph, for those that don't know, is the founder of Puffalib, which is an open source toolkit for reinforcement learning focusing on extreme simulation performance and broad environment compatibility. The library wrap and vectorize diverse RL environment so that existing RL algorithm can be used out of the box. So it's pretty intense work at the intersection of pure research and engineering. Before that, if you're an early beginner and want to build practical AI skills for your career instead of doing research, <laughs> I highly recommend the Scrimba Learning Platform, which is kindly sponsoring this video. The platform UI makes it uh, super easy to actually work on the right coding skill to get you to build things that will be used by real users. I strongly believe that understanding how the AI system work at a deep technical level and knowing how to use them pragmatically go hand in hand. The course I usually recommend for beginner is the full stack developer path because it takes you from like knowing absolutely nothing to being able to build like actual application deployed. It's like a hundred hours um, and it goes like everything from HTML to AI engineering over here to have like a five hours uh, module all the way down to databases and uh, deploying your uh, your stuff. What I like is like when you go into one of these courses, right, you have like the, the slide decks going over here that is talking about a bunch of stuff. Uh, but after that, like you, you have the code straight in the same view, right? And then it stops. And you can actually like modify uh, the things in there and uh, start to build it and you can run it internally. It will just kind of run and then like, give you some feedback um, over there. Yeah, it's pretty well made. So check out the link in the description for 20% off and to check out their massive library of free content. So let's talk about the long list of prerequisites for doing research. There is absolutely no prerequisite for doing AI research or any research for that matter. None whatsoever. And this is very, very important. You have to take a few seconds to internalize like this truth. The minute you think you need to go through so-and-so gate in order to learn and discover new things, you're kind of lost because there's just no way you're going to get to a mastery level in everything you're using in the course of a research project. Like, I'm not saying you have to be <laughs> dumb as a rock <laughs> to do research, right? I'm just saying there's literally no prerequisite. Like, anybody could go ahead and work on a problem and learn the stuff that they need along the way to be able to like make a discovery, literally. The only prerequisite you need to have is being stubborn enough so that you just go and do the thing. <laughs> like it doesn't matter if some research project by another lab looks complicated because you're going to read the paper anyway, multiple time. It also doesn't matter if the tools you need to use for the experiments are complicated because you're gonna like read the manual and learn how to operate them anyway. It also doesn't matter if whatever mathematical proof look complicated and hard to follow because you're going to spend however long you need in order to understand it and like understand the flow of the thing. You're gonna read that anyway. This truth here is why you see sometimes a very, very young researcher like Joseph was at 16 that are able to go into labs that you will consider work class without too much trouble. They understood they can just go ahead and do the things. Once you internalize this uh, kind of hard to swallow truth of there being no prerequisite, uh, the second step is that you're gonna commit, not just about doing research or engineering works, but commit in a specific long-term direction. This one is hard for most people, even for researcher, because as you're working on your research project, which by the way, is most likely going to go nowhere, like most research projects, 
you're gonna look over your shoulder and you're gonna see another field and then you realize that wow things seems to move so much over there like so much discovery is being made uh, and you start to think that maybe it's time to kind of pivot switch field or change direction this is usually a dangerous move to make because most of the promising discovery didn't really make logical sense at the time or show any sort of promise at the start it was just like a few stubborn researchers going forth in a direction because they believed in it until they reached something meaningful. You have to first and foremost figure out a research direction that is calling you like deep within. It doesn't have to be logical at all. You just have to feel very strongly about it. In my case, it's mostly a calling about understanding learning and how it can be optimally applied to humans. For Joseph, he wanted to make RL agent for complex MMOs. One of my supervisor, Dr. Sassen, just found it super cool how a neuron could learn at the molecular level. That, that, was, that was his calling. You don't have to justify this to anyone. It's like, it's all fine. Anything goes. But you have to commit to a direction that feels good and move over there with a strong purpose. The last element you need to do what I would qualify as like good research is having long stretches of dedicated work in a given direction. You ask any researcher out there working on like hard problem what they actually want, and it's literally just like <laughs> long enough stretches of uninterrupted work. That's it. This is the secret ingredient. If you're interrupted all the time and go off doing this or that and related task, at the end, you won't have enough reasoning time to push the frontier. There was this saying that I think like it was the mentor of David Lynch for the painting stuff he was doing that was saying, if you want to get one hour of good painting in, you have to have four hours of uninterrupted work, which apply beautifully to research. So you cut the distraction, you focus, 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 and you buy yourself enough time to just think through problems. That's kind of it, really. There's literally nothing else. You can start today if you really want to. We're going to chat with Joseph Suarez, a PhD from MIT and founder of Pafalib about his own experience in doing impactful research. And by the way, this was a part of a larger interview. I need to finish it someday. Uh, I did with Joseph and Dan, who is a contributor uh, at Pafalib. But uh, I really got inspired here by Joseph's story, especially at the start and why I keep on going. Um, which I think will be useful as to that in peace for uh, people that want to get started doing research. Enjoy. Can you, can you tell us a bit the story about like your academic career here? Oh, up, because I think you, you mentioned that you work, like you interned in Fefe Lab. Oh, uh, that's way with, back. Like, Andre, that was, that's half uh, a lifetime ago. Almost. Not <laughs> quite. I think I was 16 that's... maybe back then. Oh, Jesus. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I started... I mean, I, you can't really call what I was doing back then research, right? Like this was more bumbling around in the dark. I guess that's some sort of research. That's, that's, that's research. I that's guess research. that's kind you, of research. You bumbled, you bumbled around. Yeah, I was bumbling lab. around. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, it was just, I was a very enthusiastic high school student who was reading a bunch of papers, trying to understand this new AI ML thing. Keep in mind, this was a couple of years after, after AlexNet, right? So. It was really just starting to take off back then. People were just starting to make proper use of GPUs even for it. And yeah, I bumbled my way over to there. Justin, I worked with Justin, who agreed to supervise me on that. I did some things which vaguely re resemble research there. I was working on computer vision. Met Carpathy a few times there. He's a funny guy. A really cool lab. You know, there's a lot of the fundamental computer vision work was happening back then there. Um, and then I got to Stanford as an undergrad, and I immediately started working on ways to do research. By the time I'd got there, I'd already started something that vaguely resembled what neural MMO would be, but I really didn't know enough to make it work. By about a year or so in, I was doing natural language processing research. I published my first bit on that, was hyper networks and highway networks, just some generic, generic NLP research, kind of just getting my, my toes wet on that. But that ended up being rather important because, you know, I started working on some more computer vision research, but then when I went to present that paper, uh, this is when all the Dota stuff was just starting. And Ilya was there presenting the 1v1, the Dota 1v1 results. And this was ridiculously cool to me because I'd already been thinking a little bit about uh, the recent RL developments, 
I'd kind of taken a little bit of a crack at the first prototype for Neural MMO. I had, wasn't even really using RL for it yet, but I was really just thinking about what types of environments would be interesting. Um, and I had it in my head that, hey, we have these arcade games, right? But like MMOs are the coolest genre to study for this. They're really long-term. They have all this sort of complexity to them. And anyways, Ilya gave this talk. And at the end of it, he sort of finished with a question about the environments and what types of environments we should study. So I went up to him and I said, hey, I've been building this exact thing, but I'm an undergrad and I've got about two GPUs to my name. They're built into my desk. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I ended up there for a summer. I ended up staying there a little longer as well. I built the first version of Neural MMO there. Uh, I met Philip, who became, well, a professor at MIT. I followed him there for my PhD. And I just worked on Neural MMO that whole time. And it ended up being a lot, a lot of engineering. There ended up being a lot of, a lot of things which in retrospect seem very simple, but just weren't obvious back then. It's like... RL was really, really stuck in a, a number of myopias, and it's you know, things seem clear in retrospect, but really weren't. And after spending so, so long, the, the point of this, right, is after spending so long thinking about how we get RL to work on more complex and interesting environments, I wasn't just going to leave it there. And I wanted to make what I'd figured out more general and see if I could then take a crack at making the field as a whole uh, easier to use. If I can make it work on neural MMO, I can sure make it work on simpler M's. Can I make stuff faster? And I frankly didn't even expect that we were going to do remotely as well as I've done so far at all. You know, maybe I thought that it was just going to be a little business. Maybe we'd come up with some useful advancements. But really, really, um, the field has moved quite, quite far since then with Puffer. And I'm very, very proud of that. It's been a lot of work. I think I worked, I've been putting in more time in the last couple of years than towards the end of my PhD a lot. Don't tell my advisor. <laughs> but because you're yeah. you're a free man now. <laughs> you do it out of your own Yeah, free will. yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of it, right? Is that like I don't have these constraints. So I don't have to like sit down to yeah, but... frank on a, a paper that I don't want to write, you know? It's to write the grant. Yeah. I don't have to well to my lab's credit, I didn't have to do that. But it's still there's Academia has a playbook, and by very nature of having a playbook, a lot of the advancements are going to be outside of that. And that's what I've been doing, right? Is I've just been approaching the problem in a way that it wasn't approached. That being said, <laughs> what's your main motivation here to continue working on Puffer AI, but also like reinforcement learning in general here? It's just ridiculously powerful. I think this is going to be at least as important as language models and nobody's doing it to the point that if I don't do it, it won't get done. I mean, that's really it's it. A divine imperative, basically. <laughs> okay, this if, is if, look, if I uh, thought somebody else would do it, I would, I go do something else with my life, right? Like, why am I going to go uh, do something that's going to get done anyways? I genuinely don't think that this will get done if I don't do it. It yeah. definitely, it definitely won't. People are not really doing yeah. it, and yeah, this, this was, this was what was really big, like in 2017. Like you could read uh, Carpathy's uh, blog, uh, "Policy ah, Gradients" yeah. is the the title of that. He's like, well, you know, he he notes after implementing it from scratch, he notes it seems it seems to have a you know a lot of a lot of power. Uh, it's pretty pretty nifty how it kind of just works. People thought that this was really going to lead to to intelligence, and uh, yeah. It might, but we'll never know if we don't make it really good. I have one more this sort of comment good. on that, which is good. I didn't expect to be doing Neural MMO even for my whole PhD. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, yeah. I, you know, I've done this project for seven years and, you know, the whole thing was presented as, oh yeah, I was just going to work on this forever the whole time. Um, but realistically, I was an undergrad starting a PhD, right? Like. It's kind of tough to just go join DeepMind or OpenAI out of undergrad back then. Um, they were way smaller groups back then as well. So I just went and I did my PhD and said, okay, I'm going to work on this myself. But I kind of had the expectation that what I was doing was sort of obvious. Like if you're looking at all the game AI around there, the natural next thing you would do is try to solve an MMO, right? So I completely expected either OpenAI or DeepMind especially having been there and like done some of the preliminary work, I totally expected one of them to just like 
go partner with Blizzard or somebody and solve World of Warcraft. Like, that would be an obvious big project to do. And nobody did. <laughs> so, it, yes, things actually just don't get done if you don't do them sometimes, right? You know, you have this impression that for every problem, there's a team of scientists working on it, and it's simply not true. Like, there are no. plenty of problems where it's a really awesome problem. It's important. It's fundamental in some ways, and it just won't get done. We have a few questions from the community here. There's Bill that is asking, how does he handle his own research plus contracted R&D plus other consulting work? Uh, a day in the life of Joseph plus how he handle his fitness will be cool in research plus company work. Because also you're streaming like crazy and I know you're working <laughs> at the same time. Um, a bit, yeah. So what does it look like for you a day in the life of, of Joseph? I can tell you the most recent block. So typically, I, I tend to work in blocks, right? Because nobody can just be on all the time. It's I work in like a few weeks at a time. If I can get a few solid productive weeks in on a problem or a topic of focus before I take a couple of weeks to sort of tune, tone down the hours and regroup a bit, that's solid. And typically, I align these around fitness goals at the same time. So at the moment, the last few weeks, it's been get up at seven, seven something, um, make myself coffee, you know, get ready, go be out running by eight. I go run just under six miles, um, get back, shower, get breakfast, and check whatever messages I have to check, set up whatever meetings. I handle a little bit of the business stuff uh, if there's anything to do there. And I will turn the stream on if I don't have anything pressing. And I will work on this past couple of weeks, there have been two major problems I've been working on. So in this block, one of them is really, really high scale, a large scale data visualization for RL. And the other one is lower level perf optimization. So I've been working on those two problems. I will work on that usually straight through until six. While I'm here, it's really convenient because I can go get my strength training in just passively throughout the day. That saves me a whole bunch of time. I will grab dinner and then in the evening depends on what I have to do for client stuff. So several days I'll typically be doing either some dev on an environment myself, or I'll be reviewing dev on an environment, or I'll be discussing, you know, an outstanding problem, or I'll be managing stuff with, with clients. Um, and if that's all taken care of, then I'll be working on uh, more of the open source stuff because ultimately like the farther ahead I get on the open source stuff, the more problems I have that are just solved out of the box for new clients. And that's it for the day. I hope this was useful. You can follow Joseph on X over there for kind of daily research and engineering motivation. He do live stream almost every day. You can see him deadlift sometime in the day in the background. Uh, and do check out Puffalib on GitHub. It's an awesome library. So have a fantastic day, folks.